Michael, thank you uh, very much uh, to the Australian Institute uh, for International Affairs and to the Australian Red Cross to have invited me and to give me this opportunity to speak about uh, the question whether uh, the law of armed conflict, and perhaps it's not a bad idea to call it the law of armed conflict and not international humanitarian law because finally it's not so humanitarian because uh, even if it was respected in armed conflicts, armed conflicts would still be a profoundly inhumane situation. The, uh, the idea is simply uh, of humanitarian law to try to guarantee a minimum of humanity in a profoundly inhumane situation which should be avoided and we have international law trying to avoid armed conflicts but as you know it does not always work and I will nevertheless call it as uh, it is now generally called uh, in academia and also in the Red Cross world I will call it international humanitarian. Now is it in crisis? Well I would say international law and the international society are in crisis uh, because states do not want to have the rule of law. We know in states like Australia, Switzerland, uh, domestically, states do not want to have an international society governed <coughs> by international law, but by power politics, by interests, by frustrations, by uh, uh, egoistic ideas, by obsession for sovereignty. And therefore, it's not astonishing that international humanitarian law, which is part of international law, but as great English expert Sir Hirsch Lauterpacht has put it, it's at the vanishing point of international law, um, is also perceived as being in crisis. But anyway, if international law was not in crisis, there would be no armed conflicts and we would therefore not need uh, international humanitarian law. There would nevertheless be violence, but it would not be organized violence which is called armed conflict. Now, the substance of international humanitarian law, made mainly codified in the Geneva Conventions and the additional protocols, the Geneva Conventions of 1949 and the additional protocols of 1977, is in my view quite adequate even to modern armed uh, conflicts if it was sufficiently respected. Um, obviously we could always dream and within the Red Cross we always dream about better uh, rules but uh, states do not want to have these better rules and therefore we can live with what we have including in uh, Contemporary armed conflicts, which most of them are not of an international character, fortunately, by the way, this is a big progress that there are less uh, armed conflicts between states. I was uh, yesterday visiting in Melbourne the Remembrance uh, Museum under the monument, and uh, we can all be happy that. Uh, such murderous situations like the First World War do no longer happen. Uh, but there are non-international armed conflicts and some of them are uh, conducted against armed groups which are labeled as terrorists. Uh, some people claim that uh, humanitarian law is not adapted to, to those conflicts. Well, I would say uh, if it is a genuine armed conflict, and often the word armed conflict is abused in the fighting against terrorism, because terrorism is crime, and crime has to be uh, 
fought against by means of law enforcement. But some, like the Islamic State, are clearly an armed group involved in a non-international armed conflict. Well, I would say, if the mere Article 3 common to the Geneva Conventions, in each Geneva Convention there is one Article 3 which applies to non-international armed conflicts, a relatively short article, but if it was respected today by all sides in Syria, the situation of the Syrian population would be totally different. And so the problem is not that the law is not adequate, but that the law is not sufficiently respected. So let us speak, and that's the rest of my presentation, about respect. Because the crisis, the perceived crisis, is a crisis of respect. Here too, I think as a starting point, uh, a lot of people forget about history and therefore think today everything is worse than previously, while I think those people simply forget about history, think about past wars and the cruelty and the horror of past wars. But uh, there has been progress, even in the field of implementation uh, at least as far as prevention and repression of violation of international humanitarian law are concerned. And now I speak, I'm a grandfather, so I don't, I'm not embarrassed to speak like an old man, but uh, I must say, uh, when I started to deal with humanitarian law, when I joined the International Committee of the Red Cross, also, uh, staff uh, in 1985, and I worked uh, until 1997. In the beginning, international humanitarian law, and I will call it IHL to make my speech shorter, uh, was a kind of secret science. Uh, it was dealt with by some nearly exclusively Western military lawyers and by the International Committee of the Red Cross. And that was it. While today, everyone deals with international humanitarian law. I was this afternoon in the, at the University of Melbourne. There, were plenty of, there are plenty of researchers. There are several professors who deal with humanitarian law. There are courses in humanitarian law. Unfortunately, this is not only the case in Geneva and in Melbourne, but all around the world. Uh, I'm sometimes concerned that there are too many students who engage in humanitarian law while um, there are not enough jobs, at least for lawyers. Fortunately, I mean, in Australia, you don't have to deal a lot uh, with court cases on humanitarian law. And the same in Switzerland. And so, so, there's a lot of interest. Uh, the Red Cross and the Red Crescent movement has been quite uh, successful in uh, in generating more interest, uh, the universities teach it, but also in armed forces. It's incredible how in the last 30 years, all around the world, in so many countries, also thanks to initiatives by the International Committee of the Red Cross, which I will call ICRC to be short, um, the training in humanitarian law has improved and in many armed forces this is done now seriously, not a theory, but as real training. How, while soldiers are trained how to use their weapons, they are also trained against whom they may use their weapons. Journalists become better and better in international humanitarian law. And even the UN Security Council, um, which uh, in the 1980s and 90s adopted some resolutions which were real nonsense from a humanitarian law point of view, now uh, adopts resolutions which are technically correct. Um, and states have adopted legislation implementing humanitarian law in the domestic legal system about war crimes, about uh, the use of the emblem of the Red Cross and the Red Crescent. So prevention has made progress. Repression has also made progress. <coughs> um, 
thanks first to the establishment of the ad hoc tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and for Rwanda, and now we have an international criminal court, and all this has nevertheless incited, uh, encouraged states uh, to prosecute themselves uh, uh, war crimes, and it's still very much insufficient, but nevertheless it's better than what was the case with war crimes during the universal obligation to prosecute war crimes under universal jurisdiction, which means wherever the crimes have been committed, every state in the world, as soon as the alleged perpetrator is on its territory, has an obligation to prosecute those crimes. Uh, this did not really happen between 1949, when it was adopted in the uh, Geneva Conventions, and 1992. Well, now it happens more more, and the ad hoc tribunals and then the International Criminal Court have led to the fact that uh, had greatly contributed, I would say, to the credibility of uh, international humanitarian law. Um, obviously, mm, it, for the time being, this breathtaking development of international criminal law and cr international criminal justice is still largely on the paper and not in the reality. In the reality of most armed conflicts, there is still total impunity for violations of humanitarian law. But the symbol is important, and um, I was chairing for nine years the board of Geneva Call, which is an NGO uh, trying to engage armed groups to respect humanitarian law, in particular not to use landmines, sexual violence and child soldiers. And we, when the Lubanga case, Lubanga was an accused who was sentenced for having used child soldiers, was uh, judged uh, in The Hague by the International Criminal Court, uh, many armed groups in Africa or in Myanmar uh, told us, oh, we have some children here, 10, 12, huh? but you take them, and we said, oh, no, no, you have to demobilize them. And, uh, but they were really impressed, and this had a deterrent uh, effect. Fortunately, these groups do not read the website of the International Criminal Court and are not aware of the policy of the prosecutor, uh, which is to take only the big cases. And we didn't tell him, you know, with 12 child soldiers, don't be concerned, you will never end up in the uh, Probably the, uh, the tourism promotion office of The Hague must have a problem, because everyone is afraid to end up in The Hague. Uh, but that's a good sign. But let's hope that this uh, continues. <clears throat> now, the real problem is that the lack of enforcement mechanisms during an armed conflict, not before, not after, but during an armed conflict. And there, indeed, we uh, are confronted to uh, the fact that the mechanisms which are foreseen by international humanitarian law, with the exception of the International Committee of the Red Cross, I come back to that, simply do not function. There is an International Humanitarian Fact Finding Commission. It ex exists uh, since 20 years, and it has never worked, because never states have asked the Commission to work. Also, we have now the first time an armed conflict which <coughs> allegedly is an international armed conflict between two states who have accepted the jurisdiction of that commission, Ukraine and Russia. But even Ukraine did not ask, it could legally, unilaterally it could ask the commission to inquire into <coughs> violations and the pre preliminary question would be whether Russia has a control 
over the armed groups in eastern Ukraine. But even Ukraine didn't ask that because they are too much afraid that the commission would also find plenty of violations by Ukraine. Then protecting powers. Uh, there are no more protecting powers since 19, since the Falkland Malvinas War. That was the last armed conflict where there was protecting powers. Article 1 common, I come back to Article 1 common to the Geneva Conventions, which says the states do not only have to respect, but also ensure respect of the Geneva Conventions by other states, uh, is applied at best selectively and certainly insufficiently, because believe me, if each time humanitarian law is violated, all states of goodwill would react independently of their sympathy, their economic interest, their wish to export arms, and so on. Uh, uh, a state which violate humanitarian law would think twice uh, whether to do it. So the mechanisms do not work because there is no political will by states and if there was political will by states the existing mechanisms would be sufficient and without political will even new mechanisms would not uh, work. Now, here I have to nuance because new mechanisms can create political will and we have seen that in the field of international human rights law with the universal periodic review in the Human Rights Council which, when it was adopted, you hear I'm rather a pessimist person, I said this will not bring anything, while it has brought something. It has incited states reviewing, you know, all states review the human rights performance of other states, and every state has to present every four years a report, and even North Korea has presented the report, and the other states have commented the report. So, something like that could uh, mean progress. Uh, and indeed, the International Committee of the Red Cross and uh, Switzerland, which is the depository state of the Geneva Conventions, have suggested a very, very harmless and weak mechanism, but nevertheless uh, not an enforcement mechanism, not even a treaty body as we have it in human rights law, in international environmental law, Normally, international treaties foresee or also a body which is mandated by uh, the state parties to uh, oversee the implementation, not as the International Committee of the Red Cross does it through work in the field, but by discussing violations, by making recommendations, mm -hmm. by uh, analyzing reports and uh, the International Committee of the Red Cross and Switzerland suggested a very very harmless conference of state parties which would at regular interval worlds discuss not specific violations but only general problems of implementation and identify best practices and the International Conference of the Red Cross and the Red Crescent last December did not accept such a <coughs> mechanism because there were a number of states reluctant to any, any uh, outside supervision of the respect of international humanitarian law. <coughs> now, if states do not want to have a specific mechanism for international humanitarian law, they should not complain that bodies of other branches of international law look into it because the victims and their lawyers want to have a forum and they find a forum in human rights mechanisms, at least in Europe and in Latin America. The European Court on Human Rights and the Inter-American Court on Human Rights deals with uh, violations of international humanitarian law uh, disguised as human rights violations.
nations. And um, states don't like that very much. For instance, the United Kingdom, at least its armed forces, when you speak with British military, uh, enemy number one is the Islamic State, enemy number two is Al-Qaeda, and enemy number three is the European Court on Human Rights. <laughs> and, oh yeah, okay. But they shouldn't complain, because if you wanted to, to have uh, I mean, the criticism is that they are not really familiar with the laws of war, they under don't understand the specificities of warfare. And these criticisms are correct, but okay, they accept a uh, mechanism which is specific. But if you don't want anything, the others will deal with it. And the same thing is true for the UN Security Council, which is obviously politicized. But in some cases, and in an increasing number of fields of humanitarian law, the Security Council has been able to do some work. Obviously, uh, double standards. If uh, Russia, the US, friends of the US are involved, then it doesn't work. But in many cases, it works. Uh, and obviously criticism is, this is politicized, not serious, they are not, um, they don't have the necessary knowledge, yes, okay, but you don't want a specific mechanism now, this is what you get, this is your punishment, you get the Security Council dealing with it. And the third problem are armed groups, because uh, the most of the armed conflicts today are fortunate, this is progress, again. Uh, non-international armed conflicts and there at least half of the parties, more than half of the parties, are armed opposition groups. And now these groups do not sufficiently respect humanitarian law. Some of them are labeled terrorists or not. Uh, this is not of importance. I mean, what is important is there are armed groups involved in an armed conflict and don't comply with the law applicable or don't sufficiently comply with the law applicable to armed conflicts. And there, uh, their difficulties are also that these armed groups are not sufficiently engaged by the international community by all those. If you want to get respect, you have to speak with those who don't respect. This is the experience of the Red Cross. I mean, if you want to get the respect by states, you better speak with the, the military of states. And if you want to get respect by armed groups, you have to speak with the armed groups. But today, this is often seen as uh, support to terrorism because every armed group, believe me, every armed group around the world is, is labeled as terrorist by uh, the government against which the armed group is fighting. And some of the armed groups are even labeled by third states or by the UN as terrorists. But obviously, I agree there are some armed but don't always think about the Islamic State and Boko Haram. But yes, they have really the policy of violating humanitarian law. It's somehow they are proud to violate humanitarian law. They show, which is an interesting phenomenon, they show in their promotional videos how they burn uh, alive a Jordanian prisoner of war. Now, believe me, in Syria, and I don't speak for, for the International Committee of the Red Cross, I speak as a professor. In Syria, the regime of Bashar al-Assad violates at least as much humanitarian law than the Islamic State. But the difference is the, the regime of Bashar al-Assad doesn't make a video when they torture people systematically in their prison, while uh, the Islamic State is proud of it. But OK. These are some. Some others are simply not sufficiently organized to uh, comply uh, with international humanitarian law. And all of us, including in the Red Cross, we have to be conscious that the more we develop the law, the more complicated it becomes for these unorganized armed groups or little organized to comply with the law.
Nearly all armed groups are convinced that the law is biased against them, and some of the rules are biased. Uh, you know, in the perception of armed groups, international law is something made by governments for governments, <coughs> but simply saying, well, now you have to respect it, but they didn't have any uh, contribution or occasion to uh, speak about it. That's their perception to contribute to those rules. And some rules, I have to confess, are indeed unrealistic for armed groups, but it's a minority of rules. We have nevertheless to be conscious that a development which is generally applauded by humanitarians and even more by academics that today the law of non-international armed conflict has been brought closer to the law of international armed conflict contributes to the uh, to a decreasing realism of the law because the very detailed rules of the four Geneva Conventions which were made for international armed conflict, if you apply them to non-international armed conflict, well an armed group simply doesn't have the necessary means to comply with all uh, those rules. And just to give you one example, um, according to a very detailed study of the International Committee of the Red Cross on customary international humanitarian law, the prohibition of arbitrary detention is a rule of customary law, including in non-international armed conflict. Now, who in this room is in favor of arbitrary detention? But how do you define arbitrary detention? The study defines it as a detention which is not, uh, this is totally correct as a definition, which do lacks legal basis and uh, without a possibility to ask for uh, checking of the lawfulness by an independent uh, tribunal. Now, an armed group how do, does it create a legal basis? And how does it uh, organize habeas corpus proceedings? Mm? And you cannot say, and this is what states think, uh, well, armed groups shouldn't detain anyone because it's inherent in an armed conflict that people detain. And if you say IHL doesn't pro allow detention, well, they will nevertheless detain. At best or at worst, say, if we can't detain a government soldier, we will execute him once we, we capture him. So, unfortunately, uh, the attitude of states towards uh, armed groups is like the attitude of my granddaughter one year ago uh, then she was two and a half when she was covering her <laughs> eyes and didn't see me. She thought, I don't see her, <laughs> which is not true. But states believe that if they ignore armed groups, armed groups will disappear. Unfortunately, this is not true. Simply, if we ignore armed groups, then we cannot try to convince them to uh, and to explain them also the law, uh, to respect the law and to help them to comply with the law. And you know, to disseminate the law, uh, as the Red Cross calls it, to teach the law, is not a thing a professor tells an armed group, these are the rules. Uh, nor to make a big list of this is all what is prohibited. But rather, and this is the normal way you teach to state military, to say, okay, you want to attack this village, let's discuss how you can do that by spare, why sparing the civilian population. Somehow the argument is, dear Colonel, this facilitates your work and not is an obstacle to your work. Now if you do that with armed groups, obviously states understandably become a little nervous if I uh, teach an armed group how to most efficiently uh, wage war against the government, the government gets slightly uh, nervous. Mm. Okay, now let's come to the International Committee of the Red Cross, which does, but I'm not really neutral on this, in my view, an admirable work in the, in the field to assist and protect uh, people affected by armed conflict. 
But it is pri precisely because of its work in the field that it cannot mobilize public opinion and states against violations. Uh, when the International Committee of the Red Cross is confronted to the alternative of either insisting on the respect of the law or having access to the war victims, it will always choose access to the war victims. And this is not only an issue that obviously the working methods of the ICSE are not to speak out publicly but to do it confidentially, which has the disadvantage that states and the public opinion which can put pressure on state don't learn about uh, where the pressure should be applied and states which know where the problems are. They don't need the Red Cross to learn where the violations are committed. But states don't want to do anything except if the public opinion, and in Australia that's you, uh, put pressure on their government to say, how can you tolerate these violations? Um, but, uh, I mean, the International Committee of the Red Cross wants to protect and assist the war victims, and so it cannot mobilize states to uh, deal with specific uh, violations by certain states. And even if it's uh, confidential and bilateral dialogue with states, in my view, I don't know, because I left 19 years ago, but my feeling is clearly that today the ICSE cannot always invoke the applicable law. Just to give you a hypothetical example, I don't know what they say because it's confidential, but uh, I mean today, if the ICSE wants to get uh, improvement in, humanitarian, in the humanitarian field in Crimea, it will not invoke the Fort Geneva Convention and classify Crimea as an occupied territory because that's a non-starter in Moscow. Putin will say, you go home to Geneva if you call this an occupied territory, which we all know it is. But And the same thing in Eastern Ukraine. I mean, if by hypothesis and the ICSC is in the field and has therefore the necessary knowledge, if Russia has overall control over the groups in eastern Ukraine, then this is legally an international armed conflict. And the law of international armed conflict would protect the victims. But even in its confidential and bilateral dialogue, if, I don't know, the ICC shares my conclusion that it is an international armed conflict, it's a non-starter to tell in Moscow uh, you know, you have to comply with the law of international armed conflict because the Russian government says, no, there are some volunteers but and some soldiers on holidays, they go to fight with their tank. <laughs> holidays. <laughs> Interesting activity in a holiday. But, uh, and even with the groups, the, you know, the ICC wants to get progress in the field and so it has to discuss with those who actually misbehave and these are all the groups who are the government of Ukraine but uh, now let's speak about mm -hmm. the groups. Uh, it's a non-starter if you speak with a group and say well you are just a puppet of the government in Moscow. <coughs> uh, they will not give you anything. Why? If you take them serious. Uh, so you cannot invoke them. In addition uh, I think that it becomes more and more difficult for the ICSC to get acceptance of its traditional dual role, what I call the dual identity of the ICSC. On the one hand, a humanitarian organization which works cooperation with government, confidential, bilateral, and on the other hand, the guardian of humanitarian law which wants to uh, develop the law, wants to have additional mechanisms, and this you cannot do bilaterally and confidentially. You have to mobilize public opinion. You have to make advocacy 
not about violations somewhere, but about improvement of the law. And states increasingly say, and that's what they tell me when I speak with state representatives, including from Australia, I must say, when I speak with them, they say, we like the ICSC so much because it does such a good work in the field. But you know, these lawyers who always want to have new rules and who uh, the development of international law must be state-driven and, uh, okay, and why speak out? Well, you know, landmines wouldn't be prohibited today if the ICSC had not spoken out uh, against and the whole Red Cross and Red Crescent movement. Well, what remains, one is the famous Article 1 common, so states have an obligation to ensure respect. Uh, and as this ideally should be done collectively, but at least they can do it individually. Uh, and it would change the situation if states not against their enemies or against uh, outlaws, but against their allies. If Australia was taking, uh, telling Turkey, why don't you respect IHL in the non-international armed conflict in Turkey, for instance, this, I think, I don't know uh, enough about the relationship between Australia and Turkey, but I think that Turkey would listen more to Australia then say uh, Syria, because you don't have very good relations with Syria. So if you tell Bashar al-Assad, please uh, respect IHL, I don't imagine. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, so it would be important to do it not based on double standards, but everywhere IHL is violated and where one has some influence. Now let's not be too defeatist. Uh, states do something simply we don't know about it because the most efficient way of inciting another state to respect IHL is not necessarily to make public statements but often it is through diplomacy that you can do it and in some states indeed do something, but it's not yet sufficient. So what remains is prevention. We want to prevent violations. Um, and prevention means to get uh, to teach international humanitarian law to convince people that it is appropriate to respect humanitarian law to show that humanitarian law contains solutions for those involved in armed conflicts. The two main obstacles to efficient prevention are, first, the, in my view, erroneous perception that IHL is most of the time violated, and second, the selective perception by parties and by those who fight for parties and by those who uh, uh, support parties that their side respects IHL and that the enemy always violates IHL. Let's come to the first, and this will be my last remarks, to the first element. Uh, the erroneous perception of an increasing gap between the promises of the law, and the law promises more and more, and the sad reality in the field where the law is perceived to be systematically violated. And I would say this perception is simply wrong. Most of the time, in most of the armed conflicts, most of the people respect international humanitarian law, and you really say now, in which dream world does he live? I must say, today in Syria, I can't prove it to you. But I worked, uh, you know, for an ICSE delegate. Um, the first armed conflict is like the first girlfriend you will never forget. And so my first armed conflict was the war between Iran and Iraq. And I had to deal with the Iraqis. 
And you know, Saddam Hussein, one of the most inhumane regimes, I'm not a fan of George W. Bush, but nevertheless, <laughs> I mean, Saddam Hussein, really an inhumane regime. It executed the families of prisoners of war in Iran because to discourage their fathers, sons, and so on, to surrender to the Iranians. But the Iraqi prisoners of war, protected by the 30 New York Convention, 20,000 of them were more or less correctly treated. And all the difference was international humanitarian law. And then I worked in the former Yugoslavia, and those of you who are slightly older, um, that the youngest here remember the conflict in the former Yugoslavia, which was seen ethnic cleansing, systematic rapes, and so on. Well, when you are in the field, you saw a lot of respect also of international humanitarian law. And I think it would be important that the media, NGOs, uh, the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement also report about respect. Uh, but it is understandable, and it's a good sign that uh, the media uh, report about the violations, because the violations are the exceptional thing. And I mean, it's clear that the newspapers in Melbourne on Monday, they don't report yesterday 15,000 drivers uh, complied with the uh, traffic laws. But one person, drove uh, 90 kilometers an hour through the center of Melbourne and to killed one pedestrian. And this is the news. And, the news. and this is not a <laughs> criticism of the media, because otherwise we would have a, the Pravda at the time of Stalin, which reported every day the big successes of production in the magnesium combinate, and so on. So, yes, but the problem is, we all know, because we live in Melbourne, that most drivers respect the law. While us, we fortunately are not living in armed conflict, we could have the impression that most people involved in armed conflicts don't respect international humanitarian law, which is wrong. And which undermines the willingness of those involved in armed conflict to comply with the law, because no one wants to be the only idiot who respects with the rules which are not respected by the others. But they are respected most of the time by the others. And the second problem, which is perhaps even more serious, is, and this is my last problem, uh, is that the, um, the parties, those who support parties, even diasporas, and you know that in Australia, who have sympathy for parties, they are convinced our guys respect IHL, <coughs> the enemy violates IHL. And part of it is also those who think that they have a just cause are convinced that those who are have a just cause obviously respect IHL, while those who are perceived not to have a just cause violate IHL. And this is not true. I look at the Middle East. The Palestinians who are subject to occupation are convinced that as those Israelis occupy our homeland, necessarily they always violate IHL, which is not linked. I mean, the Israelis also on many issues respect international humanitarian law. And then, if the Palestinians really believe that anyway, the, the Israelis don't care about international humanitarian law, this creates new suicide attackers. Because if I was convinced that the enemy is totally disrespecting the law, then I say, why should I respect the law? And the same thing is in Syria. Many of you must know people from Syria who are either in favor or against the regime, and they are always convinced that their side respects and the other side uh, violates. And I think it would be important, including in the dissemination efforts, but it's difficult, uh, to explain that uh, the enemy cares about international humanitarian law and uh, 
that us humanitarian law is not about how to treat your friends, but how to treat your enemies to explain that, say, in Gaza, for those in Gaza, IHL is not the important message, and IHL it is protecting Israelis. And for the Israelis, the important message is not it's protecting Israelis, but it is protecting Palestinians. And if this message could come through, uh, which is not appreciated, because most of people like to hear, we are protected and we are victims. Well, so in Australia, the message is, IHL protects those who are fighting for the Islamic State, because they are also human beings. Obviously, they may be arrested and they may be punished for that, but they, if they are wounded, they must be treated. And it's the civilian population living in the regions uh, under control of the Islamic State uh, are as well protected than inhabitants of Australia. And I think with this message about the enemy and IHL is about respecting the enemy, uh, we could overcome this perception of saying the others always violate and we respect and therefore why should we respect if anyway our enemies uh, don't respect. Thank you very much.